Hey guys, Jester here. I know this is a little different setup than you're used to seeing on my Sunday morning review channel, but um, the table that I usually sit at is currently got my um, a, an elaborate setup for my D and D group <coughs> that meets there. That's where we play at. So I don't want to disturb that. So I moved over here to my story time with Jester Wednesday night studio where I read from novels currently I'm reading from my novel the book of prophecies but in any case I digress one of my followers um, left a message and um, wanting me to put out certain type of content uh, I do encourage all of you to do the same thing because, uh, you know, I'm not limitless in my thinking, so I, d I do appreciate when you guys, uh, you know, hit me up and let me know what you'd like me to talk about. So DM Ray com commented. Hey Kevin, I was thinking the other day that there aren't perhaps great videos out there about the various components of playing old school D&D and truly getting that old school feel, i.e. player skill versus character sheet skill, equipment importance in delving, treasure seeking and exploring versus just 5e Pathfinder 2e murder hobos, etc. Would you be interested? In putting up a video with your thoughts about all this and giving some play examples from back in your day too. It's just it'd just be cool to hear your takes on your channel. Alright, so um I wrote down a lot of notes, so I'll be referring to these frequently today. Um, just so I can keep all my thoughts straight in my head. So we got um First up, I'm going to uh, discuss the murder hobo thing. So, up until the last 10 years or so, um, I didn't even know what a murder hobo was. Never even heard of the term. So, uh, and, and for quite frankly, I mean, it sounds kind of ridiculous, the, the term, but um, really... I mean, without just kind of guessing, I, I didn't know, still didn't know what it was, so I looked it up to do this. Come to find out that it, murder hobo was a term used basically a derogatory term towards us old school players uh, because I guess there's a misconception uh, going around that uh, all we did was go, was go and murder everybody in sight and take all their stuff, so... Um, and that is a huge misconception. I mean, <clears throat> I can see where, where it generated from, and I'll get to that in a minute. But um, the, um, the concept, though, of the murder hobo it originated in video games. Okay? So you've got to understand, in the, in the video games I'm referring to is, is things like... Um, um, Skyrim, that whole line of games, um, and and other other games like that, where you you know you're fr a free wanderer, and you just you know go around the um, the countryside or, or or whatever scenario the video game has put you in, and you just kill anybody and everybody and take everything they have, you know, uh, whether they're whether they're the monsters that you're going up against or they're just innocent people in town or, or, or across the countryside villagers whatever you just kill everybody you don't care you know you're just a murderer basically you know you know and that that to me personally is a, a very sick concept um, it, it, it creates in people things that shouldn't be created in their minds um, especially when you have young children that are playing these games um, but anyway, um, but to say that we did that back in the day, that, that's, that's not true in any, in any facet. Um, 
I'm not saying that there weren't players who played evil characters, and um, and, and and perhaps the the whole um, the whole table played evil characters, and and, and that was the the um, scenario that the DM put forth was a, a group of evil characters going to do whatever. Then you know, being evil that that's understood, but to still go through a town and just start killing everybody, there's consequences to that. And if the DM was was worth assault at all, he would present those consequences to the characters. So so if you could just go up and start murdering villagers, you're gonna have the town guard come down on you. You're gonna you're you know, and if, if you're a powerful group, then you're gonna have an army come down on you. You're not going to survive, or, or at the very least, you're going to be put in prison. So, it, 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 the whole it, the whole concept, like I said, is just is just that, that we did this back in the day is it's totally crazy. And back to the video game thing that I was talking about back in back in our day in the old school era, the video games we had was Donkey Kong and uh, Mar Super Mario Brothers, things like that. Um, we didn't have these elaborate games that kids play even 20 years ago. Um, so, you know, our games were very simple. Um, we'd go to the arcade room or to the, down to the um, local, local mom-and-pop gas station that had a video game inside of it and spend all of our quarters playing, playing that kind of stuff. You know, so our imagination came from what we saw on, on, on movies and read in books or just concocted in our own head. So we didn't have the, um, the, the whatever the kids get from the video games now um, to, to, to fall back on. And so, so anyway, so I, I just wanted to get, get the murder hobo thing out of the way right from the beginning. Um, <clears throat> player skill versus character cheat skill um, that's a big a big thing that I've seen uh, transverse in th through the editions um, mainly f basically from second edition to third and beyond so between second and third that's your split um, so so your, your your basic first and second edition all um, all play, all focused on your the player skill. Okay, um, give me just a second. Don't want my coffee to get cold. So, once third edition came out, they started focusing on and creating. Uh, these stats for all your different skills and stuff and they focused on on that and they focused on the character being the um, the, the, the focus um, <clears throat> and so it, it, it became it, it changed from being from focus on the player to focus on the character and so so you have so now you have you know by the time you get to 3.5 and then now fifth everything is wrapped around the character and you've got all these all these die rolls and all these points to put in skills and and, and all this stuff to, to basically what they've done is they've turned Dungeons and Dragons into that Skyrim video game where you just stat up your character and the more the more stats you have or the or the or the the best way to, to, to stat your character that's the focus and that's how you succeed in the game it doesn't matter if you're a crappy player as long as you've got a great build on your on your character and see that's not what Dungeons and Dragons was originally created to do D uh, Dungeons and Dragons was originally created by a bunch of war gamers who 
wanted to focus less on the mass battle and more on the individual battle. And so you had you had a you had a lot of brainy nerds, um, which pretty much Dungeons and Dragons, for the most part. I'm not saying there weren't exceptions, but for the most part, your brainy nerds were the ones that played it. Anybody else didn't care. Anybody else, n nobody else really got it that much. Um, today, anybody can play it. Every, you know, they they and, you know and that's not a bad thing, but in talking about the differences between the two. <clears throat> You, um, you, your, your, the focus was on the players from basic to second edition, in so much as your characters were secondary, because there was so much chance that you were going to get killed anyway, that you just picked what would, what you thought would be cool to play. You rolled up their stats; it didn't matter what you rolled. You just plugged them into the places that, that would best suit what you rolled and the type of character that you played and then continued on the game. If, you, if that guy got killed, you just rolled up another one and, and continued on the game. The focus was on the player. And what I mean by that is, is and people, people have coined another phrase beside the murder hobo thing of, um, oh crap, what's the, what's the phrase? Um, ah, I, I forget now. I'm I'm so sorry, but basically, it's it's when you uh, oh mega mega me, meta game meta gaming meta gaming. So they they coined the phrase meta gamer, basically to again put a bad light on what Dungeons and Dragons originally was intended to focus on. Now there are other examples of metagaming, which are the true examples of metagaming, and that's that's bringing in things, having your character do things in the game that happened in the game that your character shouldn't know about, or having your character know how to defeat a certain monster when only the player has ever faced it, the character hasn't. That's metagaming. Okay? Anything beyond that is not metagaming. But the, but the phrase has been put to that, to all those other examples that, have, that, that were beyond what I just mentioned, basically to dumb down or say against the old school people. What the what the old school game was was you as the player used your own intelligence, your own wit, your own knowledge. It's irrelevant. It's irrelevant that you gained this knowledge in real life. Okay, it was your abilities to play the game. And what I mean by that is a, a, a lot of the game had to do with. Um, puzzles, um, challenges, things that would require the player to think through and understand. It wasn't he, your character rolls a certain dice and if, and, and if he gets the, the, the percentage score or whatever that, that you know that, you, that the DM de deems as the challenge number that needed to be exceeded, then then your character passes that challenge. What bullcrap? That's that's not what the game was meant to be. It's like if you, as the person, the real person, the player, can't figure this shit out, then you're out of luck. You know, the 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 character stats weren't for that kind of thing. The character stats were for what your character was doing physically. Um, yes, you have an intelligence score and you have you know but that but the intelligence score was was never meant to if you roll your intelligence score then you figure out whatever the puzzle was that's retarded okay that's that's a retarded concept and, and again that 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 was done to include a whole range of people to be able to play the game 
you know, and again, that's great that, 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 they, that they're attempting to attract more people to the game because that's more money in their pocket. <laughs> but that's new school. Old school was if you didn't have the intelligence as a person to figure the stuff out in the game, you weren't, you weren't going to su succeed. And that's why it only attracted the brainy nerds back in the day. So, um, that's, you know, that's about really all I got to say about that. I mean, because that's pretty much the difference between player skill and character cheat skill. So, um, the next thing on the list here, ah, the importance of equipment in delving. Delving meaning dungeon delving. Um, now, there, there was a lot of... Um, there was a lot of, of modules put out back in the day. Um, there were wilderness encounters, there were town encounters, but the majority of the encounters that we faced was in some dungeon setting, whether it be the lair of a giant or, uh, or, or just um, dungeons, dungeon, air, dungeon, in, uh, settings underneath um, a town building where you, you know you discovered a secret door and, and made your way down into the dungeon and that's where all the bad guys are um, <clears throat> oh let me backtrack one thing I will say about the murder hobo um, the the new way or the or what the actual real definition of the murder hobo is like I said is, is you basically you kill innocents okay we back in the day we did do a lot of killing and taking people's loot but it was never innocence it was always the monsters what they've tried to do today is change the definition which they are doing in every aspect of life these days it's changing definitions of what reality is um, but in our term time, the monsters was basically anything that wasn't human, elf, and dwarf, and halfling. Everything else was a monster. An orc was a monster. Sorry, new guys, but orcs are evil. They are, don't have any other alignment other than evil. They're all evil. Therefore, in D&D &D terms, they're monsters. You kill them, and if they have shit, you take it. Okay? Period. Today, they're trying to make, you know, they, they make it where you can play orcs because orcs are, orcs are misunderstood and all this other garbage. Okay? Sorry. If you're an orc, half orc, I mean, a orc, sorry, not half orc. If you're an orc, a goblin, whatever, you're a monster, you're evil. We're going to come in, we're going to kill you, you're going to take your crap because if we don't kill you, you're going to come in and raid a village and kill the innocents. It's as simple as that. Okay? So when the definitions started changing, that's when the murder hobo also started ramping up in whatever. Anyway, back to the importance of equipment in Belling. <clears throat> All right, so... Again, not too much focus on um, dungeoneering these days. Uh, yes, you have dungeons that you go in, and, but the focus, focus again, is more on the character skills aspect of it. And basically, you just run, run through the place. You kill as many people as you can, or, or you, you, um, you know, you take whatever stuff that you can see. Um, or, you're, or you're going after a specific, you know, reason for being there. Um, and there's not a lot of focus set on the day-to-day -day functionality of actually going in a dungeon and delving deep in there. Um, and what I mean by that is, is again, Dungeons and Dragons was meant, in its original concept, for 
you to take the knowledge that the player had of certain th things and apply it to the game. So, in Dungeoneering, you basically need to know how to spelunk. Okay? So you, you would need to know or imagine what you would need and do to successfully go through a cavern situation which is com in complete darkness because you're underground. You know, what light, what, what natural light source are you going to find underground unless it's some kind of glowing lichen? Okay. Um, so you, you've got to be prepared for things like that. And really, in what I've experienced in in um, 5e and even 3.5, the limited times that I've played, is that none of that is, is really addressed. <clears throat> but in old school, it was highly addressed. You needed to know how to do... You basically had, the, had to be the MacGyver, if any of you know what that is. Any of you new, newbies knows who MacGyver is. All of those old school guys automatically know what that means. But you basically had to be the MacGyver of whatever setting you were in. And you had to get creative to be able to accomplish the tasks that you would find yourself in um, and up against rather than just rolling the dice and letting the dice decide everything okay that's not the dice were not meant to decide everything the dice were meant to de to to decide the randomness type things and combat beyond that you never touched your dice it was all up here okay and So, I'm going to read some examples I've written down here. Um, <clears throat> so again, this is the importance of equipment. So, like in in your, in, I don't know. I'm, I'm like I said, I haven't focused that much on five, fifth edition, so I don't know exactly how in depth the equipment list is in the player's handbook. But the, but there's a huge equipment list in second edition player's handbook and. Um, you know, they, they just list all sorts of things, but again, you got to be creative. So, and, and as a DM, make your players be creative, you know, um, or not, not make, encourage your players to be creative. So <clears throat> here's a, a, a few of the, a, a, just a few, a, a few of the items that are in the equipment list in the player's handbook of the second edition, second edition player's handbook that I've written down uh, that, that you you know you can maybe use in your own games uh, or, but this is basically just to you to to de describe what the importance of, of equipment just your regular mundane equipment list. okay we got a bag of flour okay if you throw that in the air in a wide arc and poof instantly you have an instant invisibility detection. Not only does it create, if not only temporarily, a type of fairy fire effect in reverse, it also now coats the floor for easy spotting of movement footprints in the flower. You know, so if if your uh, if your magic user is out of spells or doesn't want to waste them, and you know. You, you're not get you know you uh, you and you've got the time to pull out that bag of flour, go for it. Uh, or maybe your your magic user is is tied up with uh, trying to do other things to protect the party or help the party out, and you're the character who you know uh, doesn't have anything else that you can do in this situation. Pull out that bag of flour in your backpack, toss that sucker out, and see if there's you know any invisible creatures in the area that, that are about to you know like a thief trying to backstab one of your friends or something you know who knows next on the list we got caltrops now 
Caltrips has the obvious reason. You throw them out on the floor, and you know the guy, the, the enemy comes running around a corner, and they step on them and, and get get uh, you know uh, their movement slowed, points done, damage done to them, and, and so forth. But there are some creative uses for the Caltrips too. Um, spread them across the corridor outside outside your perimeter while sleeping. And you've got yourself an instant alarm when someone steps on them. Think the scene in Home Alone when the thief is climbing through the window next to the Christmas tree and Kevin has laid out all of the uh, ornaments on the floor and the uh, thief is barefooted and he comes out and steps on those ornaments and they all break and cut his foot and he just screams out. That is going to be basically the kind of reaction that's going to happen when somebody comes and steps on those cow traps, because uh, those things are going to go through your shoes. Okay, unless you've got metal boots on, which you're going to be making clanking around and waking everybody up anyway. Chances are anybody that's going to come up on you while you're sleeping are not wearing metal boots, so them cow traps are going to hit them, hit their feet just like uh, those glass ornaments did on the thief on Home Alone. And he's going to let out a scream, and that's going to wake up or alert, wake up everybody or alert your sentry that somebody's coming. So, all right, I'm going to skip that one for a minute because I'm going to make that my last one. <clears throat> pouch of copper coins. Now, why would you need a pouch of copper coins, and why copper? Okay. Okay. So, a pouch of copper coins. Um. So, what could you use that for? I'm about to tell you. Have your magic user use one of his spells that 99.9% .9 players don't even bother having their magic user even learn, much less memorize. And that's fool's gold. And is that even a spell that is an option anymore in 5e? Um, I actually looked that up and it's not. Um, have him cast fool's gold on that bag of copper coins and you now have a bag of gold coins for one hour per level of the magic user. And this is second edition rules, of course. And this has several uses. One, let's say you're being chased by something that is greedy or likes or likes or is attracted to shiny objects. Just open the pouch, fling the coins behind you, and voila, instant distraction. Want your thief to gain surprise and you have time to set a trap? Open the bag and lay it on the ground with a few of the coins spilling out. Enemy comes around the corner and is distracted by the newfound loop and voila, instant plus to his percentage to move silently, which I usually give as 10, plus 10%. It can also be used to bribe someone, but woe to the party that is still around when the spell wears off. Are you being pursued by a rust monster? A bag of coins won't do much good, but throw out a handful of iron spikes and you should be good to make your escape. So iron spikes is another good thing to have on you, on with on your person. And we got here we go. Ten foot pole. <laughs> yes, the ten foot pole. You use this mainly for detection by setting off traps in or on the floor as you prod safely, hopefully, nine feet in front of you. If you have a high dex, this can also be used to great effect to pole vault your way across the chasm. Now you're probably wondering how to carry this pole. I mean, it's, it is 10 foot long, so that's pretty cumbersome. Well. That takes me to the next item on my list, and that's NPC hirelings. We're not talking henchmen, we're not talking followers, we're just talking about average citizens for hire, okay? So um, otherwise known as the first to die or run away. You've seen the movies such as The Mummy or King Kong where there's a uh, you got these, you know, just your random dudes that are uh, carrying the, everybody's equipment or, um, or, or 
carrying the, the torches and whatever. Okay, so you, so yes, we have like torch bearers that you can actually hire people in town to just all their job is to carry torches for you. Okay, um, let's see what we got here. Um, so yes, yeah, so the, your av average citizens and in D and D these are known as zero level NPCs that are hired to do mundane tasks such as carry torches, um, the lit variety, of course. Uh, put one in front, back, and put one of the guys in front, back and middle of the party, and your characters are now free to use that torch hand for other things, other important things like a weapon or a shield. I mean, you know, why would you need a weapon or a shield when you can carry a torch? Right. So anyway. They are also useful for tasks such as carrying that cumbersome ten foot pole. Or, in the event you don't have one, to walk out in front of the party and, in effect, become that ten foot pole. Hey, you know, they're expendable. That's what their job is to do, is to come there and do the things that you don't want your characters to do. Now, I don't know if a party of paladins would be up to using these people to do these things you know that would be up to the discretion of your dungeon master whether or not that's going to affect the your your paladins alignment or not but in any case uh, you know you can have them do that um, they can also carry those heavy chests laden with treasure so again your characters can focus on the important things like carrying their shield and their weapon as you're traipsing down the dungeon with all this loot, you know. Um, they can open doors that your thief didn't detect traps on in case he missed something. They can taste that potion to see if it's poison or not. And for the really creative player, they can dig through your backpack for whatever you're going to use the next round so you don't have to waste time doing it yourself. So you get an extra round of uh, action while you're hireling and fishing out the stuff that you need out of your backpack. Well, guys. Um, oh, oh, I almost forgot. Oh, okay, yes. This big bad boy right here. So let me see how I want to introduce this. Oh, out of coffee. I have to go get some right when I'm done here. All right, so um, uh, uh, my friend uh, DM Ray there, he he wanted me to use some examples of um, you know back back when I played. So um, I, I, other other than the equipment list examples that I did um, and the hirelings, of course. Um, the other example of, of gameplay back in my day um, that I wanted to go over is character death. Um, we, in, in 5e, they seem to shy away from, or make it har much, 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 much harder to die. And I, I, I you know, I, there's all sorts of reasons that people give as to why that is and I'm not going to get into that but in any case back in the day like I was alluding to earlier in uh, in my examples that I have on my paper that I was read, reading to you um, was that um, you know you, you roll up a character you're not focused on the character the character is not the the focus okay the focus is the player the so if your character dies it's no big deal Okay. Now, sure, if you've had a character that you've been playing for years, you're going to get attached to it. Okay, and and then when if that character dies, irrevocably, because there's so many ways to bring back a character, it's ridiculous. Okay, but if your character dies irrevocably, yes, that, that that's a pain you experience. Okay, but beyond that. And again, this this is like I said, this is the character that, that's going, that you will have played for years, okay? Because it takes a long time in old school D and D to advance high levels, and that's for a reason, okay? One, it's because most of the written adventures that you're going to play are lower level adventures, adventures. 
So, you know, once you start getting up in those high levels, then now your dungeon master starts to have to create everything, and he not, doesn't necessarily want to have to do all that. So for a, for a group of players to have a... Plus, it, it takes a long time for the player to know what the heck they're really doing to be able to, to handle playing high-level characters, okay? Uh, it's not as simple as everybody, everybody seems to make it out. Dungeon mastering isn't as simple as everybody seems to make it out. Um, so, but anyway. Um, and so, the focus, was, again, like I said, was on the player. So, if, if you, you know, you, you just rolled up a character and, you know, your group has just rolled up their characters and you go out and, and you're, you know, you're a quarter of the way through the dungeon and you got a TPK, you know. Okay, no big deal. Roll up another... Everybody rolls up another character, and you keep going, okay? Just the dungeon master now has to be creative in how to give a reason why this new group of characters are suddenly in this adventure. But Or, you know, you could just start up another adventure, whatever, you know? Um, but in any case, again, the, the focus was not on the characters. And so, you know... There was a lot of character death back in the day. A lot of character death. I mean, for instance, everybody, you know, if you ask an old school, a lot of old school players, what the most dangerous uh, module was back then, the everybody's first response is usually Tomb of Horrors. And I will, I'll grant you, Tomb of Horrors was a death trap. It was designed to kill everybody. <laughs> if you got to that fount, if you if you if you was one of the lucky ones to even get to the final encounter, you're most likely going to die. <laughs> okay. It was a death trap, but I've actually played that and I've actually ran that and there are creative players that can get through that. You know, again, you got to use your brain. You got to know when to do things and when not to do things. And, and, and again, it's all focused on the player, not your character. So, <clears throat> but if you ask me what the most dangerous dungeon or module was, I would say the D series, D1, 2, and 3 going underground traipsing through the under earth trying to get from where the giant well the, the fire giant um, home was to where the uh, queen of spiders is that whole three module thing there that was the most dangerous thing that my characters personally have ever encountered we had a party of, or a, a group of like five guys, with plus the dungeon master, and we, and this was back in the navy, we would, uh, well while we were in school in the navy, and we would get off work from, um, on on Fridays about, but we get we get out of school at noon, and then we'd have to clean up the barracks. That'd take us till about two, after we ate and everything, and so. About 2 p.m. on Friday afternoon, we'd all go to the break room, get up with all of our D&D stuff, and we'd start playing, and we would play, literally, nonstop, from 2 p.m. on Friday till about 1 a.m. Monday morning, midnight, 1 in, 1 in the morning, something like that, uh, which wouldn't give us much time for sleep before we had to get up and go to class the next day, but, uh, but in any case, uh, we'd take turns... Uh, Sending people downstairs to, to to the drink machines to get sodas for everybody. We'd uh, order takeout and have it delivered to the um, to the desk downstairs, um, and and they call us when when it arrived. We'd sit, give it, sit, give give somebody uh, money all of our money, and they'd go down and pick everything up and bring it back up. And we'd eat. Uh, if there was a lull in what one of our characters was doing, then uh, we'd take turns napping, that sort of thing. But we literally played for two and a half days 
straight. And our school was like eight weeks, I think it was. So we did a lot of, of playing through the giant dr and drow. We never did make it to the queen by the time we graduated, but uh, but we had, had just got there. But in that underground, D1, 2, and 3, and we were each playing two characters because, you know, four or five of us, if you only have four or five characters, you are not. If, if, if the dungeon master is playing or running the game as, as it was designed, you will not survive. There's just no way four or five of you are going to get through this thing, okay, unless you just hide the whole way and get lucky as crap, okay? So we were each playing two characters, so we're, that, we're talking eight to ten uh, characters going through this thing. And <clears throat> we never faced a TPK, but each one of us lost throughout the whole thing probably about anywhere from four to six characters each. Okay, so that <laughs> that right there just shows how dangerous the Drow series is. So that's my personal um, example of play back in the day. But I've got one more little thing here in regards to character death. So <clears throat> um, after after that uh, navy navy time, that first navy time back back what I just explained explained, um, I had only played up to that point. Well, take it back. I, I dungeon mastered when I was in high school a little bit, but uh, but for the most part, all I did was play until after I got out of school there in, in the navy and. and went on my ship and from that point on I primarily have dungeon mastered ever since and so throughout that all the throughout the time of me DMing um, I've had a lot of character death um, some of it was because of how hard the dungeon was um, some of it was because my players just did dumb things um, and got themselves killed um, but in, in whatever the instance was, I had a lot of character death. And this is my Hall of the Dead. This is all the characters that died that could not be brought back, whether it be something like they were dissolved in acid, their body was completely dissolved in acid, or from a monster that had acidic whatever in their, in their system and they digested basically, uh, like a black pudding or something like that, um, or whether they were dragged down to the bottom of the ocean uh, by a fish, <laughs> you know, or they failed their resurrection survival role um, when be trying to be raised from the dead, um, whatever, okay? But this is my list of dead characters. And, uh, I usually try to write how they died at the top, just for reference. So, um, this one was killed by a Vrock, which, if, you, if nobody knows what a Vrock is, that is the vulture-type demon uh, known at, in, D, in early old-school D&D as uh, Demon Type 1. Uh, and it was Roman numeral 1. <clears throat> uh, this one was killed by a red dragon. Uh, this one was killed by a red dragon. Uh, let's see. Is that the same character? Yep, yeah, same character. All right, that's just spe her spells. All right, let's go past all that. And then we got died by black notched cobalt arrow. Killed by red dragon in an act of self sacrifice. And this was a badass dude. He was a half-orc dragon slayer and the party was up against a red dragon and he basically um, being a dragon slayer he sacrificed himself so the party could escape. He is always remembered in my hall of champions. Then we've got um, Ah, killed by a Bebelith. 
and killed by a verm, which this is a, a type of fish found in the Lake of Unknown Depths, and it is this. This was uh, from the module uh, uh, Return of the Eight, and I had a almost a TPK from this verm. This is one of the cases where the players didn't act very intelligently and got themselves killed. But uh, in case we got, let's see, one. Two, three, three of them died from that fish. <laughs> All right, let's see. Then we've got, I don't know how he died. I did not, unfortunately, write the top. Uh, dead by Black Pudding. Uh, failed a resurrection save as well. Uh, let's see. Don't have a, a reason there. That's just another copy of the character that died by the self sacrifice of the red dragon. But you get the idea. But um, there, there was a lot. Oh. And I had, I had a party. Let's see, how many, how many was this? And we had the one, and we had two, three, four, five. Six, seven. Had seven characters go through the Forgotten Temple of Thar's Doom. Seven characters. Almost had a TPK. Had one escape. Now, in the process of them going through it, they 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 encountered a, another. They encountered an NPC that became a PC. Um, that, that was kept prisoner there, so that made eight total, eight total pl uh, pl player characters um, by the end of the dungeon, and six of the eight died. Um, a couple, some, most of them died in the in the original encounter, the first, very first encounter, um, but. Um, you know, the cleric died, so there was no way for the two that survived to uh, have brought back, brought anybody back, and um, and so yeah. By the time the two finished the whole thing, they uh, they were ready to get the f out of dodge, and they did so, and you know. They never came back to do anything with the remains of their compatriots, <laughs> or well, it was really, really the uh, compatriots of the the one guy, because uh, uh, most everybody else never made it down to the second level in the in the, in the dungeon. But um, in any case, so um, there you go, DM Ray. I hope you are thoroughly happy with my presentation on your suggestion, as I hope the rest of you are as well. And uh, please, uh, everyone, be like DM Ray. Send me comments and suggestions on what you, what type of content you would like for me to produce, and I will do my utmost to do that. Uh, and um, as always, um, hit the like, subscribe, and notification bell. Um, make sure you share with all your friends so more people can enjoy this channel. And um, um, oh, yeah, and also, like I, like I try to put out in my videos now, um, I don't have a Patreon account or anything like that where you can you know, leave me a tip or anything, um, tip jar or anything like that, uh, to support the channel, if you, you know, so that 
I can continue producing these things. Um, but how you can support this channel is I have a novel that I wrote uh, titled The Book of Prophecies. It's a fantasy fiction novel. Uh, it's very similar to the stuff that I talk about here on this D&D um, uh, review channel. So um, you can find the links to the hardback, paperback, and ebook formats uh, by going to the About section in this channel or you can also visit my um, Facebook page James Richmond author um, and go to the about section in that page and the links are there as well um, and you can support this channel by purchasing one of my books it would be uh, greatly appreciated and um, so yeah please go do that um, so that ends today's um, session, and uh, until always, or as always, and until next time, see you soon.